Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to this session around inflation and how uh, how farmers can be uh, managing this you know, very difficult environment at the moment that we're going into with a slightly declining milk price and costs uh, starting to uh, rise. And it's a real uh, pleasure for me to have some top class uh, farmers up here who are going to be answering some of my questions in the first part of the session and then really we're going to be throwing, throwing open to you uh, just to see um, uh, what you've got to, comments you'd like to make and questions you might have for them. So I'll introduce the top here in a minute. Uh, but my, my, my name is Paul Bird, I'm the Farm Business Lead at Dairy NZ and work on a number of projects. Uh, some of you will be familiar with the, the Mark and Measure uh, course that we've been running for a number of years, uh, helping people develop business plans. In the last couple of years we've been putting a lot of time and effort into uh, looking at the contract milking agreements and contract rates and looking at the data we've got on dairy base around that whole, whole structure within the New Zealand system. Uh, so look, I, um, I would like to uh, you know, introduce, introduce our guests here. Um, we have three top class uh, people who run very good operations. Uh, firstly we have uh, Alicia uh, Broomfield who is the recent uh, winner of the Waikato Shearwood of the Year. Uh, she grew up on a dairy farm in Kitatonga, uh, has been uh, she milking 250 cows in um, uh, Te, Te Araha, uh, for four seasons, has, runs a sort of a very low cost uh, type of operation. She has an XI degree, was CO for three years and had a, a number of other sort of professional roles. And uh, very exciting news, her and her partner James just bought a, a 70 hectare farm. When I said exciting years, I suddenly thought, actually, I might have used slightly the wrong word there. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's great. So Alicia is going to be here to uh, answer some of my questions about how, how they're operating and, and what, how, what they're thinking as they go into buying a new farm. Um, so, and then next to Alicia, we have uh, Bryce Anderson. Uh, Bryce, along with uh, his wife uh, Christine and their family. Uh, they operate two dairy farms, totaling 420 hectares in the Matamata Tiro area. Uh, Bryce is a, a sixth generation uh, dairy farmer, also has an ASI degree and started shearwalking uh, about 30 years ago. And so again runs a, runs a very efficient operation and uh, talks a lot about sort of the long term and how to set the, set the farm system up to deal with, deal with these up, ups and downs. And uh, we also have another uh, excellent operator, James uh, Halton, who's with us. Uh, James uh, farms at Pukiatua uh, and farms with his wife, um, Carolyn. They have a 114 hectare dairy farm, 400 cows, all the carving, uh, high input system, and is aiming to get to uh, 600, we might have already got there, but aiming to get to 650 kgs of milk size per cow, so that, that's really cranking out some milk. Uh, talking to James, he's yeah, just really passionate about his business. Uh, knows all the levers and the mechanics and the, and the business side of it, attention to detail, exceptional, um, county nutrition, grazing management, use of technology. So, um, you know, a good operation um, and it's a high output system, but, you know, really interested in the uh, grazing side of the business. Uh, so, what I'll do, I'm just, I'm just going to get our um, expert panel just to come over here. They, they probably want to just stand, stand up and uh, so you can see, everybody can see them. I was just sort of joking before, it's a little, um, a little bit like, um, uh, what's the Irish um, talk show host that has the stars come out on the stage? Um, but no, it won't be quite like that, but you'll see, here we go. We've got the stars anyway, got the, the main, main show here. Uh, so, Alicia, I might just start off with you. Um, you've you know, just bought a dairy farm in an environment where you know, interest rates are going up um, and uh, you know, cost inflation. Just a sort of an overall view on you know, how have you actually done that? What, what's, what are some of the key things that you've done that enabled you to actually buy, buy a farm? It should, it should be working. Hi everybody. Um, a quick background was that my parents never ever did a budget. Um, they owned three farms, but so this isn't something we've grown up with. Um, I just had to learn it along the way. So I've been shearwalking in Tiara for four years and it's just been really focused on the core principles of pasture harvested and feeding supplement only when it's needed and then just looking at every cost in the business. Um, and then our, um, do you want the yeah. Um, figures? Yeah, 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 okay, yeah. so um, the farm working expenses across those four years were $1.75, $2, $2.00 and $2.60. 
65 last season, and it's an operating profit of 2287 and 2137. So when we compare to the Waikato benchmark, there's about um, $50,000 more profit that we're making, and it's just from cost control and using our supplements properly. Um, and then, yeah, going forwards, projecting forwards for the farm, we're looking at $4 farm working expense. Our bank won't do the numbers on $4 because that's not what the average farmer operates at. So even at $5 farm working expense, it still stacks up, but we know we can achieve better than that. Just a comment from you, to, to, and we won't necessarily sort of go back uh, too far. Um, but just because you're so young, it's not too far to go back to. But just the coins around the fact that you've actually been able to get to that position where you can actually even think about buying a farm. What, just, just what, is, what are some of the things or traits that you think you have that have actually enabled you to build up the cash and save the money and accumulate? You know, how have you actually? There's some of the principal, couple of the principles you've got that have led to that point. Yeah, probably the main thing is just the drive to achieve that goal. We want to have a family that grows up on the farm, the same as us, so we have low drawings. We just, everyone I know is like, oh, well, that's always been your goal, so you just did it. Um, and having a secure place for our family to grow up and not have to move around in the Shemel King system. Um, so we've gone without other things to get to that goal. And James says you just have to keep on working. That's what he says. So. Excellent. Um, Thanks, Alicia. Yeah, and the other key point is that I've had the 200 cow sheer milking job and had cow numbers on other farms growing, releasing out. But James is 50% of the purchase as well. So I've had my business running on my own and then James has had his business running on his own. When you combine them, um, double the equity. That's great. Yeah. And just to clarify, the James here is not your James. <laughs> just in case you might go, hang on a minute, what's going on? It would be much easier. <laughs> So James, just while we're on James, I'll just, I'll just get you, James, to just to, would you be happy just to uh, just give us a little bit of a description of, you know, your sort of farming philosophies, how, and sort of how you, you know, describe your system and how you operate it and how you make it a successful farm business, what's some of your principles? So um, many years ago we engaged at first to do a business analysis and using our all the resources of our feed and they came up with the scenario of autumn carving, so we converted our feed to autumn carving. We have like 500 kilo cross feeds, and we have achieved the last two seasons so over 650 a cow. So my philosophy is around um, trying to grow as much homegrown grass with minimal inputs. Um, I haven't bought on tons and tons of super. I don't have use, I haven't used super in 10 years. Um, looking, um, we now go high input, so we're doing two and a half thousand of salts a hectare, four cows a hectare, and just trying to A, grow the grass. Uh, I try and focus on growing the grass, and I try and get stuff to help focus on harvesting it. Last year we harvested over 17 tonne of potatoes to growing out of a hectare, and my farm is in black, it is rolling. Yeah, Brian, no, thank you, thanks for that. And, and maybe Bryce, are you, are you happy to do the same? You've uh, yeah, been in the game a little while, uh, you've evolved a system that you're really comfortable with. And yeah, I suppose I'm at the other end of the scale from James. We've, we've always um, done really well out of low cost systems, so um, I grew up in an era when, when, when payouts were very low, so that's just what we've developed over the years. So yeah, so we've got a low stocking rate, about 2,500 hectare, and, um, and trying to carve early, and have long mutations, um, and pretty much trying to yeah, um, harvest that grass with as few cows as possible. So we're trying to drive as much of that feed into into production rather than maintenance, and um, and dealing with the spring surplus through growing chicory crops um, to, yeah, to get that surplus uh, cheaply into into the summer and the autumn when you know there's often holes there. So. So our whole focus is around you know, very low cost systems, so we've been around $3 uh, and under for a number of years farm um, with expenses, um, and that's, that's worked really well for us. So we're very resilient to a range of payouts, when the payout was down to $4 for those couple of years. A few years back we were able to, to still um, make a profit, so um, it, it, it is a very resilient system for us. So, yeah.
from it. What I'm going to do is, I'm, so this is a really good introduction about your sort of thinking philosophies. I'm actually just going to show you just a couple of slides around our sort of uh, projections of, you know, sort of average, where the average profit looks like. So you, you guys can say that you can see the slides down here, so you don't have to pray your nets up there. And so, um, a lot of you know, you know, the real cost of inflation, you guys are sort of living this day to day, what's happening on, on farms in terms of what, what costs are doing. And so you can see that rural, rural cost of inflation sort of double the C, you know, CPI inflation. So you all know that, that sharp red line going up, that's the reality of what's happening on farms. And we're all wondering, you know, how much uh, can it sort of come back and how quickly. Um, so that's really why we're here talking about, talking about these topics going into next year. Um, these two lines here, the, the, again, these are the av average in our dairy-based database. Uh, the blue line is the net dairy cash income, expressed dollars per kg milk solids over time from 13-14, and then we've done two forecast years. So you can see, uh, some of you will remember going back to that 15-16 season where the income was right down to uh, just above $4, and the cost were way higher than that. And then it sort of was looking pretty good from 2019 through to 22. Blue line is quite a bit above the, the orange line, which means there's quite a lot of money for debt reduction and um, investing. When those two lines come together, it, it really means there's not really any money to pay debt off or to invest in growing. So that's, you don't, you know, ideally, you don't want to be at that point for too long. This is average. You know, with our, our, our panel here are not average and they all have different different shape, shape lines. So, so that's the reality of um, what's going on. And um, that, that's the farm working expenses side of it, but we've heard some of the numbers today in terms of that, you know, there's been that $2 increase over time uh, in terms of dollars per kg of milk solids. And then my final just numbers is just breaking up some of those expenses. We can see that feed, and interest, the orange and the green lines are the two big ones that jump out at you that you, you guys are, are experiencing, are the big ones, but all those other ones are going up, have gone up as well, labour, uh, fertiliser, you know, R&M, and, and all, the other, all the other ones as well. So that's just a bit of a, a bit of detail on some of those costs, and some of our, our guests might refer to some of, some of those figures, and you might want to refer to this through our discussion. So, that's just a little bit, a little bit of those numbers. So, Alicia, just just coming back to you, I'm just interested because there's a lot of conversations going on. You know, if you go back a year ago, there was just the standard conversation going on around um, rapid debt reduction, and 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 it wasn't really an option uh, to pay off debt. And I, and I think it was a good thing that probably in most cases banks was was sort of having that as a requirement. You've got to pay off debt, and and you know that's probably helping now. Are you happy just to share some of the conversations um, you've had with, I guess, with banks since you started, and then right at the moment when you're, you're you know, you're about to borrow some more, more money, um, you know, the banks that know you the best and know you do what you say you will do um, are the ones that tend to um, be happy with you, if that's a good way of describing it. Um, I think they come to the house and they expect James is going to do all the talking, like long James, so um, they get a bit of a shock when I start talking. And James, we agreed to do the budgets together, but he hasn't really done them. Um, so the key thing is, through industry awards, I had to just learn this budgeting stuff, really, really get my head around it. Um, and I can go to the bank and say, here's the latest figure budget, look it to them and include them, so that's a huge point. Um, I got the Finance Award at Dairy Industry Awards, so they you know, just thought I was a bit of a hero after that, because ANZ is the sponsor for it. Um, and yeah, we just, since we went unconditional on our property, the payout has dropped three times, so that eroded my deposit by about 75 to 100,000, and we just had those conversations with the bank managers again, and they said, oh no, we've done, your milk price at 7.25, so you're still well in with where you want to be. And then when May rolls around and we get our actuals, then we'll um, update it again. The key thing we did was year one, <coughs> even at an $8 milk price, we're only getting about $6 because you don't have the deferred payments. So we've done year one budgets and then what it looks like status quo after that. So any time the bank asked for anything, it was either already done or 
I was able to do it in a few hours, so that is a real key point. Um, then we've had conversations around interest only and um, off farm income that we're putting in might come in at lumpy times, so James gets a dividend from one of his farms that might be in May, so rather than trying to pay principal all year, we'll be paying you know, in lump sums, so we've had that conversation with bank managers. Um, not trying to pay the principal when we're in OD, because it's just pointless for everyone. And yeah, heaps of little gems that come out along the way. That's great, thank you. And Ross, I think you bought, you recently bought a new farm. Um, and can you just talk a little bit about that uh, process in terms of your sort of um, track record and the conversation with banks and then the sort of conversations that are happening at the moment? You know, like what, what's, what's happening for you? Um, yeah, what's happened for us uh, is one of our, our eldest son runs our home farm and um, our second son came home from university and said he walked into our farm and so he did it for a year or so on the farm and then purchased another farm, so he's contract working on the second farm now, uh, so I've got two, two sons on the two farms, but um, yeah, obviously, um, you know, for us, a big, a big thing for us is to, um, you know, fix things in when we can, and um, we were very fortunate that we fixed in our loans on our own farm at a low level a couple of years ago for five years, so that's helped us buffer the latest interest rate rises on on the, on, on the new purchase, which is all bloating, so we're getting stung there. But um, the same with milk prices, we, we, we tend to try and fix milk prices into in advance when we can, but we're not currently doing that, but we have done that over the last three years, which has really helped us, give us safety going forward as to, um, as to where we're gonna sit and um, if we can, yeah, we can turn a profit and, and, um, and do what we need to do. Um, just over the long term, we've always, um, our aim has always been to, to generate you know, good, healthy cash surplus every year and to pay off lump sums. So we've always been interested in but we have the discipline to, to, um, to pay off um, money in lump sums as it becomes available. So, um, so the banks have always had quite confidence in us that we've, we've got the discipline to do that. So just having that good track record of, of being uh, disciplined has really helped us um, in terms of um, reputation that people want, the banks want to, want to bank us. So. Yeah. And um, James, just, just coming back to your, your farm system, because I know talking to you, you have a number of sort of ways of thinking about, um, you know, going to the next season and controlling feed prices, you know. So what are you thinking going into a year where it's gonna, definitely going to be more challenging? How do you, what are the things you do in a high system that just gives you perhaps more control or you negotiate stronger or just practical things you do if you're a high input system farmer or be some of the advice that you, things that have worked for you? So one of the first things I usually do is um, I actually engage an independent uh, nutritionist so that when we are looking and discussing feeds, um, there was no bias into what feeds I had to buy. So from there, I saw it come up. We sit, we sit down three or four times a year. I have maybe monthly phone calls with them as well. And from that, we come up with plans of what we, need, what we are going to need and what works. And we've learned over the last five years what seems to work and what doesn't seem to work. We're sitting below 10 kg, uh, below 11 kg of dry matter per kg of the milk solid produced on for the cow. So we are really pushing the usual around that um, nutrition and getting the value out of those feeds. So I don't have an issue with paying close to thousand dollars for a soybean meal if it's going to generate a reasonable return. Um, the other day we got off a kiwi fruit, we took one load, trying to work through the sums. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. So even though the kiwi fruit are only forty dollars a ton, we wait. It's about making ground uh, sound business decisions. So th those are sort of like philosophies. I deal with anything up to five different feed companies and sometimes you can say over $100, $120 a tonne per, per tonne of feed. And if you're talking, a, I just saw sort of a contract the other day for a tonne of tonne, well there's 20,000 bucks straight off. Great. And I'll just, I'll just throw it over to um, Bryce and Alicia, just around that same area. What, what, can you just give us some ideas on 
look, when you do your budget for next season, are there areas that you're thinking, right, well, I think I can trim here, here, and here, or is it just trim down and there's no more, there's no more trimming to do anyway because that's how you operate it, or you know, there's specific things that you're doing? I suppose because we're already quite reasonably trimmed already, um, uh, it'll just be fine tuning more than anything else. We're, we're quite resilient to, to lower payouts and, um, and, and high, high costs, so um, we haven't quite got the pressure on us at this stage. So, but we're always analysing and, 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 and trimming where the necessary. But can you be more? Can you be a bit more specific? Because when you look at your costs, you know you look at dollar, a dollar per milk sort of lower than the average. Yeah. yeah. And so, so yeah, I suppose because of our low stocking rate, um, we're not, you know, locked into having to buy and feed to fill in holes. So we're pretty much self-contained. All our young stocks at home, um, grow all our own crops. We do all the, the all spray drill. Um, so it's all all sheep we can do ourselves. Um, we do all our own fertiliser, spreading our own AB, pretty much everything we do, we're doing ourselves. If a truck comes up the driveway, it's to take something off the farm to sell, not to be something for us to buy, you know what I mean? So, so yeah, we're, we're, um, we're, all, we're already very focused anyway, you know what I mean? So, um, we're, we like to think we're resilient to a range of payouts. We don't make as much money as St James does with the high payouts, but over the long term, uh, we think we're quite we're very sustainable and resilient to whatever hopefully gets chucked at us. Yeah. Alicia, any thoughts on that? Yep, um, I know it's very boring that harvesting as much grass as you can, because we, you know, we're just going to carry on with that. Um, being organised and getting quotes, St James quoted shifting my herd and found it for $12 a cow and that could have been $30 a cow if we waited until the end of May and tried to get someone, so um, that's another thing. Do we really need all of these things, that, um, which pretty much we don't use them already, but if something came up, we've got to work on, we need it. Some other things we've quoted are uh, interest rates through banks, palm kernel, calf shavings, the herd shift, and magnesium. So they're just all the things that we're working through. Um, the new property we've brought has 40, 50 and 80 Olsen P. So we may cut back to maintenance fertiliser or sub-maintenance the first spring. Uh, cash flows low. We've got a second share milking, a share milking job to support the farm purchase and we've changed to sire approving on both farms, which is 5,000 for each herd. So that's a, you know, 10,000 adds up. Um, we've dropped our heifer numbers back slightly, so as a share milker, I was always, you know, the more heifers I can get, the better. Uh, we're paying $15 a week for premium grazing near Hamilton, so I've dropped from 60 to 50 which is still um, $150 a week, adds up. And we've got a student coming to support me through calving, so on the 200 cows, rather than get a labour unit up front, we've got a French student coming, and he'll be learning with me, and then um, cuts that labour back. Um, yeah, that's, and then just personal, some stuff we were talking about before, you know, using your vouchers for groceries and all that kind of thing. It's just, the, it's honestly the one percenters, but they all add up if our drawings are very low, so banks love that. And it's just all these little things that make quite a big difference over time. No, that's, that's right, lots of one, I think your quote was lots of one percent add up, didn't I? Yeah. And I was, I was actually down to Taranaki telling the story about a, a North of the counter that said to me, people don't realise this, but when you go shopping, take, you've got to take your two credit cards because we, 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 you put all your milk and your biscuits and sugar and your coffee and all that stuff because that's all morning tea and that's a tax up for business expense. You put that on your farm and you do all the other shopping, you know, personal. So, and all these people go, that's such a simple great idea. Well, you probably all do that anyway, but... Uh, so, yeah, so there's lots of one percent, and I'll, I'll probably just going to ask a, just another general question, but just, um, I mean, I'm probably going to come over to, to you to, to grill these guys about the systems, how they're thinking, what they're practically doing, so get some of your questions ready, because we'll be, we'll be coming to you. Um, I guess, um, James, you, you're, you know, you talking to you, you've sort of talked about that um, partnership, you know, husband and wife partnership being really important in, in the sort of farm business going forward. 
Um, and you know, I know um, Bryce has sort of talked about you know the long game and ups and downs, and it was sort of having, having that resilience to sort of weather weather ups and downs. And I just wonder whether you, you'd be happy to comment, James, on um, how important it, you know having people around you and that partnership is to you, and then having that sort of longer time frame and understanding cycles and sort of being ready for it. What, can you sort of share some of those thoughts? Yeah, so um, I was lucky to get my wife. Um, we had our 30th wedding, wedding anniversary about a week ago, so I thought that was quite a good achievement. Um, my wife actually did spend, we, when we bought our farm for the bank manager, she encouraged my wife to keep working. She was a registered nurse, so at about three years ago, she'd had enough working in the public health service, so she quit and came on a farm. And we've actually really enjoyed the time together. We do a lot of discussions together. We do a lot of analysis of things we get right and what we get wrong and we seem to create a better pathway forward for us. It means that if the staff, if I'm not there, the staff can actually ask her own question and she knows exactly the answer because we've already discussed it. And she, we work together as a team and I think that has been the real part of our success. We, we could have gone off and bought another farm but we chose to limit our exposure and limit and so we could spend more time together and, and that sort of stuff. And interesting, we're just getting to the phase of our life that we're just trying to plan our next steps in life. Right. So, like, Alicia would have had her goals and amb ambitions and we're just starting to rewrite what else for the next 10 years. So that's, that, that's the part we're having discussions. Great. And, and Bryce, just your, just your sort of philosophy, because you've been through not that you're um, that old, but you've been through a few ups and downs, uh, a little bit older than Alicia. Been through a few ups and downs. How do you think about that? And for people who perhaps are going to, I'm not saying it's, it's crashing at the moment, but just advice for people, um, you know, it could get pretty tight. And if it's the first time you've been in it, and if it goes for a year or two, you can almost be a bit all consuming. You think it's sort of, it's never, the light's never going to be there. Or what's, how do you think yeah, about I think it? the last six or seven years have been a, a bit of an anomaly in terms of had pretty stable, good payouts. Probably in my earlier times, previous 25 years before that, um, it was just up and down all the time. One good payout, one bad payout. It was, you know, very tough. And um, I just think back 25 years ago, um, and this is what I tell to, to young people who are starting out, um, is, you know, we were sheemocking on a very hard farm. Um, the Asian financial crisis had hit. And our prices had plummeted. We were sheep milking at the time on a, you know, on a hard farm, and probably we had probably no equity left. We were my wife had just had her first baby, and she had post out of depression, and everything was just terrible. You know what I mean? And uh, but you just have to push through those really tough times and just look at the, the long-term goal and uh, hang in there um, because your tough times do come, and it's just nothing worse than seeing good young people who you know good farmers who. You chuck it in just when they're about to, you know, they just push through those tough times that they would get the rewards down the track. And, um, and back in 1998, yeah, we pushed through that really tough time. And within two years, we bought our, things had improved, prices had improved, and we bought our first farm, and, you know, and, and, and we we're on our way. So um, I'd always say that, to, especially the young ones, you know, hang in there, don't chuck it in. Um, success in life is not so much about the people who are the best at everything, it's the ones who really persevere and um, hang in there uh, for the long haul and not chop and change and um, yeah and, and just be yeah just 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 don't give up basically. Yeah. Right. So, no, thank you thank you for that. Okay what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to sort of throw it out to uh, everybody here. Um, have you got any questions around what you've heard around the systems, the philosophies, how are you thinking about the future? Um, over, to, over to you. I can keep ask questions for, for quite a while, but I'm really interested in what you're thinking and, and yeah, what, what you've heard. Thank you. You've all got quite, um, I guess, good influence and tight control over smaller herds. I just wanted your opinion on how to replicate that tight control over, say, larger herds with uh, more people and therefore more sort of players in the game. Just to find out the last year, how many cows are you still thinking? Uh, something with four or five staff members, so 800 plus. Yeah. 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 Oh, 
we've got, got 600 on one farm, so it's getting near to what we call last year, I suppose. Um, so, yeah, um, so your question, I suppose, is how do you replicate that in, 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 in bigger numbers? Yeah, I suppose the same factors are critical no matter where you are on the scale. Um, just, yeah, being, being really clinical about everything you're doing and, um, you know, putting that ruler over, over every decision you make just to um, check am I really going to get a genuine return from the money I'm investing? Um, you know, is it just, yeah, is it, is it just a feel good or is it something that I genuinely need for my system? Um, in terms of what, did you have a question about labour, did you say? Is that something you said? Um, no, because we got labour. Oh, we got labour, okay, yeah. So, so I, I think it, it scales up no matter where you are on, on the system uh, in terms of, yeah, just, um, just being really focused on everything you do. Yeah, I think um, attention to detail and having system and procedures in place. At one stage we were sharing with 1,200 cows plus we had 500 cows on our own farm. So, yeah, we... I was stretched pretty thinly, so we just had operations manuals, systems and procedures. And I suppose I just like to um, just have those monitoring points that I keep monitoring in my business. It's, it's identifying that staff member that you can ask what's going on in the team. It's those little things that you can just one-on-one, -on -one, where you gather that information. You don't gather the main information as a, as a tip, how the team's working as an individual team, as a team collectively. Just as when you talk to one or two individuals, that's where you get the best information. One, one extra thing I was going to say was, um, yeah, good staff for everything. They're worth, worth their weight in gold. You can never overpay a good, a good staff member, so they're critical to everything. I do get picked on for only being 250 cows, um, but for the last three years I've had a full-time staff member, so the week is, you know, I can have all the knowledge, but if that person doesn't have it trained and explained, then they will never do what I want, you know, get the results. And then I'm involved with Mum's Three Farms and the other farm that I have cows left into. So although my little unit is running a tight ship, so are the other ones I'm involved with, and I've not got the same input in those ones of me, it's just training and explaining. Hi there, um, thank you for sharing your stories, there's some wonderful insights in there. Um, I'm really keen to hear a little bit about how you make uh, investment decisions on annualised cash flow around things that you may not expect value from in that particular year, so investing in potentially environmental outcomes or future proofing, like how do you all that and do you have like a five or a ten year investment horizon and then try and cash flow that back or can you give me some maybe some examples or some insights as to things that you know you might not get a direct income from that year but how do you make a decision on whether that makes the budget or not? Um, one of the things I do, I've invested in a hell of a lot of technology and Somewhere on a, on a boat is a, another two hundred and twenty thousand dollar Missouri company in, in my direction this year. So I just put that around. That's going to help. It's not going to really make me money, but it's just going to save me money and, and that sort of thing. I look at it as a five or ten year return on that. Um, but also, it's it's around creating efficiencies within my business that you can't realise. I just take an approach. Yeah, I just take an approach that. It's got a physical, it doesn't necessarily physically have to give me a return, but if it gives me a return in time and well being, and that sort of stuff, those things are just as important as a physical return. Don't really much to comment on that one, but I suppose at the end of the day, all these things, um, when it comes to yeah, wanting to invest in different things, at the end of the day, you've got to have cash dropping out of the bottom of your system to even think about investment. So, I've always thought more about, you know, maximising the cash dropping out the bottom. Then I've got the options, if I so choose, to implement these um, purchases. And, you know, and, and, and I'm prone as well to, to investing in things that, you know, not always stack up 100%, but as James says, sometimes, you, you know, to, to keep your interest in farming at a high level and to keep that enthusiasm going, I also invest in things that probably don't quite stack up 100%, but it just keeps the enthusiasm levels high. Um, I've got milk meters and sow count meters and 
um, automatic drafting and, um, and all those types of things. And um, probably they don't really stack up 100%, but it really engages myself and, and the whole farm team. And, and, and sometimes they're the things you can't quite put a dollar on. So, yeah, so that's how I see some of those decisions being made. And I'm at the other end where we can't spend anything. <laughs> Otherwise, we, we have to work out what will keep us in business. And technology and all those things for us are nice to have. So they're not something that will give us an instant return. In the environment space, there are lots of things that we're doing already. We don't need you know, investing in concrete or other things that cost money are not on our radar right now. But we're not just ignoring the environment. We have lower stocking rates. We bring in these feeds, so there's lots of, you know, a list of things that we're doing to still keep that environment that tight, but, um, yeah, these things we can't afford that other people have the luxury of. Great, thanks, Alicia. You may not want to answer this question, but what banks are you with, and has their attitude changed towards you recently? Um, so when I was going around approaching banks, our shearmilking job was coming to an end and going into solar, so we knew we either had to get another shearmilking job for three years um, or try and buy our own farm. And I got told not to go to specific banks because they were all about bringing money back in. And I met with those banks and they said, well, we've been bringing money in for a few years now, we need to give some more out. So um, we're currently working with two banks to come up with the best option for us. Yeah, um, I have a love-hate affair with banks a little bit, but um, uh, I'm quite brutal on banks because um, you know, I regularly change banks to keep them on their toes because I find they get lazy and they start taking advantage of you after a while. So I'll just, uh, after five or six years, I'll approach another bank and say, what can you do? And if they all always want new business and they normally give you some fantastic deal that you can't really turn down, so, um, and it actually keeps the bank you're with on their toes because they know that you're not just um, there for good, someone they can just take advantage of, and, um, and that's what I found that they do do once you, um, if you don't um, keep them, yeah, on edge. I was just checking, I was looking around the room going, we've got big sponsors around the room, mate. Okay, far away. Yeah, I suppose I'll, I'll be the same. Um, we um, approached banks when we first went shearmilking with ASB. Then um, they went to support us into our last shearmilking job, so we looked into National. And National wasn't going to support us into the farm, so we went to Benzie. So it's about we creating a relationship with those banks. Other banks have created a relationship with Benzie when we were involved in shearmilking for the year with the Benzie. And they, helped. they said they were going to help us buy a farm, and they did. One thing, it's not so much the bank manager themselves, it's the, it's the culture coming from down the top, coming down, which is the big issue, and, and, um, and yeah, you can read the signs and, and, and know when yeah, the writing's on the wall when they're, they're trying to extract their last dollar out of you, yeah, pretty much. So Frank, I think we might be down for our last, last question before we finish up. Uh, good question around, say um, you, you're all three pretty, seem pretty sharp operators, I guess what sort of contingencies do you have in place so you get to step back? How involved are you in the day-to-day -day operations? And uh, is there any, uh, I guess, I hear some succession planning there, but uh, for those two older guys, yeah, could you step back? Uh, were you very involved in the business on a daily basis? Yeah, I'm very blessed that I've got two sons who are currently running our two farms, so, so I'm very, very thankful for that. Um, but I suppose at the end of the day you have to create uh, a system that they want to be involved with, you know, in terms of succession planning. Um, and it's a two-way street, obviously, but yeah, too often you see kids who have a lot of ability, they, they walk away from the family farm because um, the opportunities aren't given or that it's too late by the time they are given. So I've tended to go earlier rather than later and allow them to, to grow as a fill, filling that position. So that, that's been my attitude. And um, yeah, at the end of the day, you just have to, my strategy has been with that is to allow them to um, make mistakes and learn um, as we all done when we 
doing when we were younger, we make mistakes, we learn from them, you have to allow them to do that, not be you know, heavy shepherding them and um, watching over their shoulder every little step. And I think they really appreciate that and they, and they really grow that way and, um, and enjoy their farming that way. So, yeah. yeah, I'm a first generation dairy farmer, so I, it's quite good I came in with a clean slate and I've chosen my own way to farm. I have got three kids to a university and one's just done his degree and he wants to go off and he spent four, five years in America getting his business degree. So, um, yeah, at this stage we do not have a succession plan. None of them seem interested, so we're just, that's, that's what I'm saying. In our life we're just starting to come up with plans to what we do and go forward. And we have accurate operation manuals and procedures and all that sort of stuff, so if, if I do step out of the business, I can do that. But, yeah, I suppose we'll just have to watch that space. I've got a few goals and ambitions I want to do in the, in, in the near future, which we are possibly we are looking into some of those niches at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Could, we, could, could, could be someone here that's interested to partner with you, so you never know. Hey, hey look, 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 we're, we're, we're going to bring the session to an end, but just really want to thank our, our speakers, and I suppose just one little idea that, that's, that I've been thinking about listening to these guys is that is one of the greatest investors in the world is an Indian, Indian chap who now lives in America called Manish Pabrai. He's had one of the most spectacular investing returns over uh, 20 or 30 years, and he says that humans um, naturally do not do well at cloning, and he, he talks about cloning in terms of going and finding really successful people, talking to them and just copying exactly what they do. And we naturally avoid that um, as, as just sort of a thing that we do. And so I, I would just really encourage you to try and uh, not do that. I think the industry, the dairy industry is actually, our industry is pretty good at this, so we've got some exceptional people, farmers here, and a whole lot out there, and I think if things are not going as well as you'd like them to go, just you need to go and talk to people, go and talk to people who are perhaps um, really um, doing well and thriving, and just start copying ideas of, of what you're doing. You know, the industry is set up uh, for that sort of concept. So thank you all very much for share, sharing your ideas with us, and I'll just get you to put your hands together. Um, for our